Okay, everyone rested, got their coffee, got their water, got their pastry, because we're about to go on a astronomical ride like you've never been on before. Like Star Trek, we're going to adventure places. I want to make sure everyone's got their notes. And... Okay, who doesn't have notes now? Because we still have a few left. We want to make sure. All right, it looks like everybody has notes. And I hope everyone has a pen. Okay. We're going to begin at the beginning. Remember the Lord said he declared the end from the beginning? So we go to the beginning to find out the end. Now how many believe the king is coming? That's right. And the big question is, are you ready? That's the question. I tell you what, I would rather be wrong and ready than right and unprepared. So, so for me, let's, we need to be a bride without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. We need to uh, be ready. And so let's go to the beginning. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. It says, God said. Okay, these are God's words. When God speaks, what are we supposed to do? Listen. And so listen what he said. He said, let there be light in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them. Now, I don't have time to go into all of this, but it's the fact that our pagan calendar, we only follow the sun. The Muslim calendar only follows the moon. But God said, I want them. He wants the sun and the moon. And it's only the biblical calendar that we want to go by when it comes to what God is doing. We need the other calendars to relate to one another. But just like I said, when I lived in Garden City, Kansas, people had to have two clocks because they lived right on the border of a time zone. You drive one mile, it'd be an hour later. And so uh, when we want to know what God is doing and hear from God, we have to be on His calendar. And so, take a look at these. I have a total lunar eclipse at the top, and then a partial lunar eclipse. And then to the far right is a total solar eclipse. And the middle is what we had this last week, an annular uh, solar eclipse, and then a partial solar eclipse. Now, when we hear about God creating the sun and the moon and the stars, He says it is for what? Science. Science. We would think He created the sun and the moon for light and heat. That's not even number one, two, three, or four. That comes like number five or six. Okay, so God said the number one reason why He created these things in the sky is to send us signals. Like one is by land, two is by sea. And then he said it's for seasons. And in the Hebrew, the word season there is not winter, spring, summer, fall. It refers to the Moedim, the festivals. So in other words, God created these things to send signals to us on his feast days about coming events. Look at Luke 21, 25. It says... There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Did that come as a surprise when we just read in Genesis? That's why he created them. So if God says, I created the sun and the moon and the stars to send signals on my feast days, it should not surprise us in the last days if we see signs in the sun and the moon and the stars on his feast days. I mean, this is just simple logic. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Faith comes by what? Hearing. But we're supposed to hear what? The word of God, not other man. He says, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Here, here's a picture of space. I don't, you know, one particular picture from Hubble. Isn't this just incredible? I mean, I don't know about you, but I love astronomy. I love space, because what does it declare? The glory of God. Look at all these stars. In Psalms... 19, verse 1 through 7. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. One of the interesting things is where it says declare there, uh, if you can read the Hebrew notes I put there, it's the same word for like a scribe. In other words, it's like God has been writing in the heavens. It's like God is the scribe, and He's writing the whole story. So the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament Shows his handiwork. That word, if I want you to notice, I'm going to read the next sentence. It says, day unto day utters speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. Do you know in Hebrew, there's two different words for the word show? The first time when it says the firmament shows his handiwork, that's one Hebrew word. 
But then the second time, where it says the night shows knowledge, that's a different Hebrew word. So you have two different Hebrew words here with two different meanings. In one sense, that, that first one implies like a poem, like poetry. The second one is something different, and we're going to look at that here in a minute. Oh, right, before I go to that, let me finish reading this. It says, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Do you see Paul in Romans, the verse we just read, was quoting Psalms 19. Do you see the connection from the verse right above in Romans 10, 17 and 18? How their words, their sound went into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. He's quoting Psalms 19, 1 through 7, talking about the heavens are declaring the glory of God. In other words, it's like it's written in the heavens, and just like we talked about yesterday, if we have ears to hear, we're going to hear what the heavens are declaring to us. And then it says their words to the end of the world. What's fascinating, uh, that word line there refers to like musical notes that are singing. It's like the heavens are singing a song to us. So that if we can only tune in to what God is trying to say to us. And then, look at this. Here's the, I have all the little planets and the sun in our solar system here in this picture. And it says this. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And you know what the word for chamber there is? The hoopa. And so here it's like he created it, uh, you know, as for a tabernacle, like Sukkot. And, but here you have the chupa. That's why he created it. And then it says it's like the bridegroom who was coming out of his chamber, out from his chupa. And he rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from one end of the he uh, heaven, his circuit to the ends of it. And there is nothing that is hid from, hid from the heat thereof. The Torah of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Well, now that's different. How many people believe the way you win converts is by showing them Torah? That's what this says. It's the Torah of the Lord is what's going to convert the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Tell you what, I'm a simple guy. And if, if, if we begin to understand the testimony of the Lord and the Torah of the Lord, He's going to make us wise, isn't He? I have an, on your notes a Strong's number 5608, which shows you where the word to declare, at the beginning, heavens declare. It means to score with a mark, to tally or record, to inscribe, to enumerate, to recount. So in other words, the heavens are enumerating the gospel. Now, let me just insert here. Danny talked about this the other day, but I want to really emphasize this. What is the difference between astrology and astronomy? I want nothing to do with astrology. Okay, the problem, and here's how you can tell the difference. Astrology, it's all about you. Astronomy, it's all about God. Okay, so if we stay God-focused, not man-focused, we're not going to get veered into all the weirdness. Okay, I want nothing to do with astrology. And the other thing with biblical astronomy, I do not set dates. But what I do is I just kind of look... I don't know how many of you like CSI or Crime Scene Investigator, where you look for patterns, you know. I look for God's patterns. And then when I see God's pattern, to be honest, out of doubt, I go, oh, that's God. I know that's God. And what he's trying to tell me, that I don't know. But I know when God is speaking, and I ask God for understanding of what he's trying to say. Now, in uh, that first show... You can see it's the noon Gimel Dalit. I have that as Strong's number 5046. And so here's what it says. Where it says the firmament shows his handiwork, or like his poem. It says, it means to stand boldly out, to announce always by word of mouth to one who is present. Specifically to expose, predict, explain, to certify, a messenger, or rehearse. So in other words, the heavens are rehearsing out the events that will be happening on earth. That's what it's saying. They stand boldly out. It's always by word of mouth to one present. So in other words, if you're not there, you're not going to get the message. If you're not watching, you're not going to get the message. And then, uh, 2331, Chava, which is the second word for show, we get the word Eve from. Okay, you see the word life, high, right there at the beginning. So in other words, what the heavens are doing, they're living out what's happening. 
That's what he's trying to say. That the heavens are living out what is happening in the heavens. And I believe Daddy's going to be talking about that a little bit this afternoon. How the, there's just like there's the war on earth, there's a war going on in heavens. The hosts are fighting against one another. In other words, if, if we understand what's going on in the heavens, we're going to also see as in, as in heaven, so on earth. Just like in the prayer. Now look at Deuteronomy 4, 26. God says, I'm going to call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. Okay, it's always in the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? So God says, okay, heavens and the earth, they're going to witness against you. They're my witnesses. And what do witnesses do? Testify. They speak. Okay? So here, it's like the moon. Right? The heavens, the moon, the stars, earth. Everything's going to witness against us. Look at Psalms 89. Let me go back one. Psalms 89, 35 through 37. Look at what it says. God says, once have I sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. Now, how many of you know God's not going to lie to David? Yes, it says, his seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me, it shall be established forever as the moon, and as a faithful witness in heaven. Okay, so the, the sun, the moon, the stars are God's faithful witnesses, right? Now, do you remember what the Hebrew word for witness is? It's the ayin dalet. Do you see that? It means a testimony uh, prince also. And it comes from the word, uh, the same word ed can also be pronounced odd, which means eternity, like leolam by ed. Okay, so this word witness also implies eternal. So God's moon and the sun are to be eternal witnesses. Are you following me? So these, these, the heavens are to be eternal witnesses of the glory of God, testifying about the glory of God. So now, everyone is familiar with the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4. I have it here up on your notes. And if you'll notice, in every Torah scroll, the last letter of the first word is enlarged. And the last letter, Achad, the Dalet, is enlarged. Well, it's amazing if you put those two letters together, what do you get? But the word for witness. And so here we say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay? That is to be an eternal witness forever. And so it's amazing that in every Torah school, the eye and the dollar are enlarged here. And when you put it together, it's to let us know that this is to be an eternal witness. Now let's take a look at this word for a minute. Again, it's always root words within words. And I'm going to show you some other words that are tied in to these two letters. Genesis 21.30, if you remember, it says, uh, And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shall you take of my hand, that they may be a witness to me, that I'm the one that dug this well. Okay, so here you have the letter He added in the Hebrew. But again, it's to be a witness. And the letter He, as you know, means to behold, to reveal. This is a, re this is, I want you to behold these you lambs. This is, this is the witness. Now here's something that's fascinating. In number 17, 7, I have three different translations with three different English words. But it's all the same Hebrew word. So let's look at some of the differences. One of them, it says, Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. Another verse says, Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of testimony. Another one said in number 17, 7, Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of meeting. So what's fascinating about this is this. What is this word? Moed. This is your the festivals. This is, the, this is what the festivals are. Okay, before I go to that one. So look at numbers 1, 1 and 2. It says, the Lord spoke unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle of the congregation. And you know what the word is there? It's, it's Moed again. So right here, you have it being translated as witness and testimony and meeting, and it's to be forever. The Ayan Dalet there. On the first day of the second month, the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, take you to some of all the congregation. Now here, the word congregation is spelled differently. The first time congregation is mentioned, it's Moed. 
But this time, it's a dot. Okay? But again, so the same English words can be translated differently, but I want you to notice, notice the same root word is a forever witness. And so here the congregation, what are they supposed to be witnessing to? The festivals. We are to forever be proclaiming God's festivals as an eternal witness. When you think they've just been relegated to some shadow and have no meaning, you're not being an eternal witness to what's God doing. Now, we're going to look at another one. Well, before I go here, let's stick with the word moed. It comes from Strong's number 3259, and literally it means an appointment. A fixed time or season, specifically a festival, could be for a definite purpose. And basically what I want you to realize is God has a day timer, and he says, here's what I want to meet with you. Now how many of us, again, if we have a boss, and, and the boss tells us he wants to meet with us at 10 o'clock on Tuesday, are we going to come up to him and say, no, no, that doesn't work in my schedule? Can you meet with me on Thursday at 5? How long will you be an employee there? Not very long. Okay, when the creator of heaven and earth says, hey, I really want to meet, I mean, how many of you would want to meet with God personally? I mean, this is... I mean, we might be impressed if the governor or the president or something wants to meet with us. I mean, we would do everything we could to make that appointment. Well, here the creator of heaven and earth has made an appointment and says, Hey, I really want to meet with you. And we might think, Oh my goodness, I can't believe he wants to meet with little of us. You know. But God says, Come on, I want to meet with you for heaven's sake. I have a special divine appointment. Now think about this. When the Shekinah was in Israel, does that mean that God wasn't in China? He was everywhere, but he's in a special way in the wilderness. Well, the same thing. When you come to these festivals, it's not that God isn't anywhere else, but he's in a special way at these meetings, so we want to be there. Now, let's add the letter U at the beginning. And you have another Hebrew word, and, and this is where you get the word moed from. But you have, again, to fix upon by agreement, by implication, to meet at a state of time. And then it says to engage for marriage. Hmm. And, and your marriage, in, in one sense, God wants to forever be a spouse to you, a married to his bride. All right? Now, how many of you want to be at the bride of the Messiah at the wedding? Well, don't you think it'd be a good idea to be at the dress rehearsal? Okay, so if you're at the dress rehearsal, you got a better idea of what's happening. Now the dress rehearsal is not the real event, you're rehearsing, which is why the Moeds were dress rehearsals for the real event. For heaven's sake, why in the world would you not want to be at the dress rehearsal of the wedding of the Messiah? As a matter of fact, in the Gospels, I don't have the verse here, but there are people that, uh, a parable where God says the king had a wedding for a son, he invited all these people, and what they say? No, we don't need these dress rehearsals, they were shadows. <laughs> what are you thinking about? And so they didn't get to come to the wedding. All right. Let's look at Genesis 17, 10, 11. God says, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you will be circumcised, and you'll be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it will be a what? Okay, it's that same Hebrew word, old, and it's a sign of the covenant between me and you. But here's something that's fascinating. Look at Genesis 34, 15. It says, but in this we... Will we consent to you, if you will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised? Remember that event where they were going to, uh, the Shechemites, you know, Dinah was raped, and then they decided, okay, if you all be circumcised, okay, they all had to be of one consent. Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay, well here, it's the same Hebrew word for sign. So in other words, let's look at this now at Luke 14, 16 through 18. It says, Then he said, uh, He unto him, A certain man made a great supper. He bade many, sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one, what? Yeah. Began to make excuse. The first said to him, I brought a piece of ground. I must need to go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. You know what this is saying to us? When you realize that these signs, we have to consent that that's a sign. If we don't consent to the signs of the festivals and all of this, that's fine. But we, if you realize the word consent and the word for sign is the same, we have to agree. Just like if you're the coach at a baseball team and the coach wickles his nose and you know rubs his head, that means steal or don't steal. If you don't, if you don't consent that that is the sign, chaos happens. 
This is why, as the body of the Messiah, we need to consent that we agree that, God, you can be the one to set the signs and we'll follow. We don't set the signs. Okay? All right. Look at this. If you saw this sign, what would you do? All right. But here's, a, here's the amazing thing. How would you like to see, let's say you're going 60 miles an hour and you saw this sign. What would you do if you were going 60 miles an hour and you saw this sign? <laughs> okay. The signs in the heavens are signals, not that the event's going to happen on the day of the sign. Just like if you have an eclipse on a certain day, that doesn't mean that it's going to happen on that day. I'm not setting dates, but I'm saying these are signals. Whether it's eight feet ahead or eight miles ahead, trouble's brewing, trouble's coming. You following me? So these signs in the heavens are basically like God signals saying, slow down. Listen to my words. Look at what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to communicate to you. Trouble's ahead. Does that make sense? Let me go ahead and go. Here's an example. If you saw this sign, what would you do? It is time to run. Danger. Bull ahead. If, if you if you're if you're not following this sign, if you don't pay attention to this sign, this is going to be the result. Okay. So all I'm saying is now, how many of you know? I mean, there's a lot of people like that be out there and prophesy this and that and this and that. And a lot of times, more my first reaction is, do you keep Torah? If they say no. I'm sorry. You know. But here's the thing. How many of you know we cannot control an eclipse? You know, any person may control an eclipse. Okay, and we don't control that calendar. So that's how I know a prophetic sign in the heavens because man can't control or manipulate it. And this is a sure word from God. Okay, in Psalms 147, oh, let me see if I want to do this right now. Okay, I want to show you something. How many of you remember when Jupiter got hit? Remember when Jupiter got hit? Yeah. 21 different fragments hit it. It was started on the Shabbat, July 16th, through July 22nd, 1994. That's when that event happened. But you know what you may not be aware of? It was the ninth of Av. Judgment. Judgment. This is when the temple was destroyed both times. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. And what do you see? 21 fragments hitting Jupiter. Now this is incredible. Especially, let me see, I want to make sure I've got my notes. Let me see, I don't want to go ahead too far. I have a lot of verses running in my mind. And I, I reprinted my notes. And so I don't want to jump ahead of myself. But I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead of myself. <laughs> And uh, if I forgot to print them, then at least you'll have heard it. <laughs> what is the planet Jupiter's name in Hebrew? Then it has to do with righteousness. It's righteousness. Like a Thadic. The, uh, uh, the Tzadik Dalit Kuf. Is that what it is? Okay, Tzadik Dalit Kuf. Sadik. It's like a, your Thetica box. It, it, it's righteousness. So here we see Jupiter representing righteousness, falling on the day of judgment, and God says, I will judge the world in righteousness. I'm going to be showing judgment in the planet Jupiter on the night of Av. I'm trying to show you my judgment that's going to be done in righteousness. Now, there was more to this that I got this morning that just went ding, 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 ding. And so I'm going to close with that. So we're, we're going to we're going to come. We're going to get back to this. But, I, but uh, that when I saw this and I'm looking at the year, I said, what's there's something significant or something significant. And then all of a sudden, the lights came on. Uh -oh. <coughs> now, you know what else it was? The Torah portion that weekend was Devarim. These are the words. These are my words. Just like the ten words from God. So God is speaking 
The very Torah portion is Devarim, which means these are my words. I'm the one that's speaking here. I will judge this world in righteousness. <laughs> but there's more. <laughs> you know what's amazing in Psalm 147.4? God says he tells the number of the stars, and there are so many stars, I can't even pronounce the gazillion that it is. But it says he calls them all by names. In other words, God takes these stars very personal. God, the billions and gazillions of stars, God doesn't treat even them like a number. He gives them names. And you know the names of these stars, some of them are mentioned in your Bible. Right here, you see the sun. You see how little our sun is? There's Sirius and Pollux and Arcturus. <coughs> Arcturus is huge. It's, yeah, it's not the Canis Majoris. Canis Majoris is the big dog, but this is the big little dog. <laughs> I want to, uh, before I go on, I want to tell you a little bit about this star. Because this star is one of my favorite stars. <laughs> Do you see, or uh, Bootes, that's the constellation, I used to always say boots, but it's from the Hebrew, it's Boootes, and Bo means to come, and you notice the sickle in his hand in Revelation, what does he do, he has a sickle in his hand, and he's coming to reap the harvest, and this word's the word to come, and you notice Arcturus, is that star is located in Arcturus, and do you know what? Arcturus means in Hebrew. If you go to Job 9, 9 and you read that word which maketh Arcturus, and you go and look up the Hebrew word for that, it's the Ayan, the Yud, and the Sheen. Ayan, Yud, Sheen. Aish. It comes from another Hebrew word, which is Ush, which means also to come, to hasten, to hurry up and come. So the constellation, as well as the star, both applies the coming of the Messiah. Now, if you go to Joel chapter 3, verse 11 through 16, I don't think this is on your notes. I think this is when I added. Joel what? Joel chapter 3, verse 11 through 16. If you look up the word where it says, assemble yourselves and come, that is the word, same word for Arcturus. Assemble. The word to assemble is the same word that's translated as Arcturus in Job 9. And then it says, and Bo, come. So this verse has to do both with the constellation Bootes and the star Arcturus having to do with the coming of the Messiah, which is what Joel 3 is all about. So let's read what it says. All you heathen, gather yourselves together round about. There caused the mighty ones to do what? Come down. It's what it says, to come down. It's like God is saying, come on. <clears throat> come down, O Lord. Let the heathen wake up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen put in the sickle. Oh. So do you see, that even here in Joel, you see the constellations of Otis. He's got the sickle in his hand. It's time to come and judge. For the harvest is ripe, come, get you down. The press is full, the fats overflow. Does not this sound like the book of Revelation? Yeah. Yes. That's what I'm telling you guys. This is this sign here. It has to do with the coming of the Messiah. You see it plainly in Scripture. Now, I'm not telling you when. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just telling you, well, there's so much I don't know. The more I know, the more I realize I don't know. But I like to share what I, at least I see, and then people can accept it or reject it. I don't care. It says, for their wickedness is great. And then it goes on to say, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision, the sun and the moon shall be darkened. Okay, here's your signs in the heavens. And see, I'm not getting weird. I'm not getting into astrology. I'm giving you scripture, and I'm just quoting the verses, showing you what it says in the Hebrew. And it has to do with these last days and the signs that God already said He's going to be doing. The stars will draw their signing. The Lord will roar out of Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake and the Lord will be the hope of His people. Yes, and the strength of the children of Israel. I 
don't know how many of you have heard of E.W. Bullinger, but he lived in the late 1800s and he wrote a book called Witness of the Stars. You can get it free on our website. If you go to our website, uh, where it says get connected, and then you go to like ministry links or some other link like that, we have links to a whole bunch of free books. And this is one of them, and so you can follow up on all of this yourself. But here's what he wrote concerning the constellation Bootes, which means literally the coming one, or he comes. It says that the picture that you see here is of a man walking rapidly with a spear in his right hand. You see the spear in his right hand, and a stick on his left hand. And this is also, he says, referred to in Psalms 96.13, which isn't on your notes. But it says, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world where? In righteousness. That's your planet Jupiter. And the people with his emet, his truth. It says, it is probable that his ancient name was Arcturus, as referred to in Job 9.9. For this is the name of the brightest star in the left knee. And Arcturus literally means he comes. In Isaiah 51.5, what does the Lord say? My righteousness is near, my Yeshua is gone forth. Now think again of righteousness as Jupiter, salvation as Yeshua. He says, my arms will judge the people, the isles will wait upon me, and on my arm shall they trust. Let's look at Acts 17.31. Again, because he's appointed a day. In which he will judge the world, how? In righteousness. By that man whom he's ordained, whereof he has given assurance to all men that he has raised him from the dead. So in other words, we can see this whole concept of God judging the world. On the night of Av, in one sense, he, he's giving a signal. I'm judging Jupiter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge the world in righteousness. Right? And there were 21 fragments that hit Jupiter. Now, obviously, 3 times 7 is very significant, both the number 3 and 7, the fact that there were 21. Okay, so now, let us talk about some of these other ones. I, oh, let me go back. Do you see uh, Canis Venetachi right next to Bootes in this? Uh, those are the two dogs. Where did you get canine from? Okay. Well, right here are these two dogs. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Many of you may be if you've been following along uh, for years. But Canis Venetachi is where the Whirlpool Galaxy is. And you know what's in the center of the Whirlpool Galaxy? Look at this picture that Hubble State sent back. It's the cross. This is the letter top, the beginning and the end. This is what is right there in that constellation. Okay. Let me... Now, do you remember, what did I say Bootes has to do with? And what does Arcturus have to do with? Okay, uh, Arcturus is basically the word to assemble, to come, to hurry and come. But Otis means to come. Now, I want to transition here for a minute. This talks about gamma ray bursts. Okay, and it says that a gamma ray bursts are short-lived bursts of gamma ray photons, the most energetic form of light. At least some of them are associated with a special type of supernova, the explosions marking the death of especially massive stars. Okay? This is quite fascinating astronomically. This made the news when this, uh, well first off, I mean, I'm a kid. And so I had to go to the children's section to understand this of NASA. This is NASA's website, okay? But it's the kids section, I always like to start there. <laughs> but do you see this? This is a picture that they actually got a photograph of a few years ago of a gamma ray burst. Here it is right here. I have the yellow. Watch it blow up. It's, you go see it. Watch the little in the yellow. You'll see the star. Did you see that? When they got the video of the explosion? Watch right. Right there. Boom. They actually had it recorded on their telescopes. This massive explosion of like 10 billion suns that happened out in the universe. And one of the amazing things to me is you'll notice this came out from NASA on March 21st of 2008. And it talked about this massive gamma ray burst. And look what he says. It was a whopper. Okay? This blows away every gamma ray burst we've ever seen so far. Well, guess what? March 21st was Pearl. Okay? And you know what was kind of fascinating to me? Because I love this kind of stuff. I thought, wow, I wonder where this big gamma ray burst happened. Oh, geez. 
which means I'm coming. Oh my God. In the constellations, Ooh. which means I'm coming, is where this gamma ray burst happened. Now that was in March 2008. So I thought that was kind of fascinating. Okay, remember how big Arcturus was? Mm -hmm. Here's Arcturus now compared to some of the other stars. Look how big some of these are. I mean, there's uh, Regal, all the Baron, Beetlejuice. Do you guys know where those, what constellation those stars are in? I'm going to show you. Here's the constellation Orion. Right there. There's Beetlejuice. Okay, let me go back. See the word Beetlejuice in his armpit there? There he is. That's Beetlejuice. See his foot? That's Regal. And I'm keeping kind of the size dimensions for you. All right. I don't know if you know, but that's the Horsehead Nebula, which is in Orion. Many of you may be familiar with that. You can see where it says Horsehead Nebula. Yeah. But that's the picture that they find in that constellation. And we talked about Aldebaran was in there. Aldebaran is in the eye of the bull. Taurus. Aldebaran is very, very significant. And the bull is very significant. All right? Now let me see where I am at. Okay, in Job, it also talked about in chapter 38, verse 31 and 32, it says, Can you bind the sweet influence of Pleiades? You see Pleiades? Right there. Let me come back, back it out. There's Pleiades. You can see the word Pleiades. And let's bring it back up. There's Pleiades. So that's mentioned right here in your Bible. You can see that. Job 38, 31 and 32. Or loose the bands of Orion. So he's talking about these specific constellations, which are right next door to each other. Pleiades and Taurus. And then you have right next door the constellation Orion. So these are all biblical. It says, can you bring forth Matsarot in his season? Or can you guide Arcturus with his sons? Okay, so he's talking about Nocturus, he goes back to Booti. So these three constellations are what are of particular interest here to God. Otherwise, he wouldn't have mentioned them. But here's what's fascinating. The Hebrew word for Pleiades. I want you to look at this. I have this in your notes. The Hebrew word for Pleiades is Kima. And it's a cluster of stars. And it refers to seven stars. Seven stars in particular. And look at 3558. It comes from uh, the root word here, Kumas, which means to store away as a jewel, a treasure. And so here you see these seven stars of Pleiades being stored away as a treasure in the constellation Taurus. Some of you are tracking. Now, let's keep looking. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 16 through 18, it says, Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened, and he heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his name. And he says, they will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them. Amen. How many of you want to be tucked away in the constellation Aleph? Amen. Taurus, the bull. As a man spares his own son that serves him, then shall you return and then you're going to discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves not. Look at Amos 5.8. As, see, this is the difference again between astronomy and astrology. Look at what it says. Seek him that makes the seven stars. Don't get caught up with the seven stars. Seek the one who makes the seven stars. And Orion. And turns the shadow of death into morning and makes the day dark with night. That calls for the waters of the sea. Pours them out from the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. So here you have the seven stars or jewels. And what do you find in Revelation? In his right hand or what? Seven stars. This is referring back to Pleiades. Okay. You know what the Syriac name for Pleiades is? Sukkot. Oh Booths. And Sukkot is how many days long? Seven. Now, what Pleiades means is the congregation of the judge. 
So these are the seven stars in Revelation. This is the congregation of the judge or the ruler. This comes to us through the Greek Septuagint as the translation of the Hebrew kima, which means the heap or the accumulation. This is God gathering together his treasure. So t there's your seven stars. There's Pallades. And again, the Taurus is the Aleph, which represents God. So this is the constellation, the bull, and Aleph or Aluf means ox or bull in the Hebrew. That's why this is his focus, and this is like the number one constellation, like, a lot, uh, like the Aleph is the number one. This represents God. Pallades represents the seven churches, or the, the body of the Messiah. The heap, the that's what's accumulated, which is tied to Sukkot. You see in Psalm 144, 14, it says that our oxen may be strong to labor. That's the word aloof. So this is, this is the, the letter aloof in the Taurus, which has to do with everything that Frank has been talking about as well. Aleph also means a family, from the sense of yoking or taming, like an ox or a cow. And what do you have in this picture? You have the picture of a bull who's rushing forth. With mighty energy and fierce wrath, his horn set so as to push his enemies and pierce them through and destroy them. You see that little star at the top of his horn is Alnath? I put that up there, right at the tip of the bull's horn. That is part of the, you can't really see it because it's a little dark. But Alnath, that little star is attached to the tip of that horn. Well, first off, let me say this. The stars in the constellation Taurus present a brilliant sight. There are at least 141 stars. Besides two important groups of stars, which both form integral parts of the sign. The brightest star, which is in the bull's eye, right there, okay, that is all the baron, which means leader or governor. Hmm. You almost see the word devar in there, the word. Mm -hmm. And it's in the bull's eye of the bull. And that very star means the leader or the governor. That's why Pallades is the congregation of the leader or the congregation of the governor. The star at the left tip, uh, at the tip of the left horn, is the name El Noth, meaning wounded or slain. Another prophetic intimation that this coming Lord should be first slain as a sacrifice before he comes. That is what that name means of that star. No more coming forth to suffer and die, a sacrifice for sins. The reverence now is only to his second coming in glory, his coming unto this earth, and not to suffer for sin. This is why Hebrews 9.28 talks about him coming the second time unto, uh, without sin unto salvation. But this time it will be a coming in power to judge the earth in righteousness, and to subdue all the enemies under his feet. It's a prophecy of Messiah, the coming judge and ruler and lord of all the earth. And the name of the sign in Chaldee is Tor. We get Taurus. In the Chaldean language, it's Tor. Now here's what's amazing. The more common name was Sar, which is from a root, which means both coming and ruling. And what does Sar mean in Hebrew? A prince. As a matter of fact, in Joshua chapter 5, verse 15, it talks about the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua. Well, the word captain there is Sar. And who do you think the captain was? Yeshua. And he says, take your shoes off your feet. You're standing on holy ground. Well, guess what? Watch this. We're going to add a vav. And you know what that becomes? Bull. But guess what? You add the pay to get shofar. So here you have the whole concept of the bull of Taurus representing the prince, representing his voice speaking out as a shofar. So let's go back. You have Sar. Okay, you put in a vav. You get uh, the bull and then you get shofar. Isn't that fascinating how these are all tied together? You have the bull, the prince, and the shofar. And... What does Deuteronomy 33, 17 say? Let me see if I got here. Okay, Deuteronomy, now I, I like to stick with the Bible. Look at Deuteronomy 33, 17. His glory is like what? Taurus. The heavens declare the glory of God, and here he's saying his glory is like what? 
The Taurus, like a firstborn bull, his horns, like the horns of the wild ox, together with them he shall do what? Gore the people to the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh. Why? In Jeremiah 31, 9, Ephraim is my firstborn. So this ox not only represents the Aleph and God, but represents God's firstborn, Ephraim and Manasseh, who with their horns are going to push the people to the ends of the earth. Let's make for lunch. <laughs> and I'll go ahead and finish, and then we'll have Danny. You can, do you, it's okay if we, I take a little bit more after, after lunch? Yeah. Let me see, I got, I got a few more pages here. But it is, wait till you see what's coming. Let's, let, me, let me just see a good place to stop if I go a little bit more. Let me see. I mean, you can see why I got excited about this. Okay, let me let me read. I got. I'll read. Okay, I'm going to read you just another couple more verses. Okay, and then we'll go to lunch. Look at Isaiah 34. This is verse one through eight. And what does he say? Come near. This is like the word bow. He says, "Come near, you nations, to hear." It's like he's shaking the nations. You listen up, you nations. I'm talking to you. And he says, and heed you people, let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all the things that come forth from it, the indignation of the Lord is against all nations. His fury against all their armies. He's utterly destroyed them. He's given them over to the slaughter. Also their slain will be thrown out. Their stench will rise from their corpses. The mountains will be melted with their blood. The host of heaven will be dissolved. The heavens will be rolled up like a scroll. Their hopes will fall down as the leaf falls from the vine, as the fruit falls from a fig tree. My sword has been bathed in heaven. Remember in Revelation, what does he have in his hand? And out of his mouth what's coming a sharp sword. And indeed it will come down on Edom and on the people of my curse for judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made overflowing with fatness, with the blood of lambs and goats, the fat of kidneys of rams. The Lord is a sacrifice in Botra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. And then look what it says. The wild oxen will come down with them. This is with the host of heaven. The wild ox is coming down. The young bulls with the mighty bulls. Their land will be soaked with blood, their dust saturated with fatness, for it's the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense, for the cause of who? Isn't this interesting? So this whole constellation Taurus is pictured in the heavens, and it's written in the book. It is the prophecy of a coming judge and coming judgment that is coming. Look at Psalm 44, 4 and 5. You are my king, O God. Command deliverances for Jacob. Through you we will what? Push down our enemies. It's through your name will tread them under that rise up against us. We are not to be afraid of these last days. We're going to be the wild ox, the ones of Ephraim and Judah that are stomp under. The word there means to war or to butt with the horns. Okay, so what's going on in the heavens is a sign of what's coming on earth. I don't know if it's a mile ahead or eight feet ahead. But this is what God has been telling us is coming since 1994. He's been warning us of this coming judgment, so He's gracious. Yeah. Let's look for a minute at some, song, uh, some signs in the heavens, and, and then we'll go to lunch. <laughs> Solar eclipses. Back in 2008, I saw that eclipse over the Temple Mount. Okay? This was in March. Yeah. And then, when I was researching this, I went to the solar eclipse chart, and I noticed in 2008, 2009, 2010, there was only one total solar eclipse each year. There were your annular eclipses, like we saw last week, but there was only one total solar eclipse each year. And if you'll notice, they're on different dates. It was August 1st, July 22nd. July 11th, but guess what? On the biblical calendar, they were all the same day, the first of Av, the, first, the day Aaron died. Mm. Beginning judgment. Okay? And when I saw that, and I thought, oh my goodness, judgment is coming to the nations in 2008 around Rosh Hashanah. Because that's, that's, this is the time of judgment. Well, guess what? That solar eclipse that happened, happened in the head of the crab, which was unclean, representing the nations who were coming to attack Israel, which is Virgo, and here the Lion of Judah is stopping the nations from trying to come and attack. Oh. And that solar eclipse happens on the head of the crab, 
which meant judgment is coming to the nations. This was on the 1st of August 2008. So back then I was telling people, look what's coming to the nations, big time of judgment. So here's that eclipse I saw in March. And then I noticed, wow, these total lunar eclipses are happening in April 2014, October 2014. And both times they fell on Sukkot. And then I went to the next year. And what do I find? Oh my goodness, here we have a total solar eclipse beginning Nisan 1 of the religious calendar, followed two weeks later by a total lunar eclipse on Passover, followed by another lunar or solar eclipse on Rosh Hashanah, followed by another lunar eclipse on Sukkot. And I thought, if you don't think God's trying to communicate something to us that's going to be happening in 2014-2015, you're not listening. That's your Yeah. <laughs> I want to look at now is uh, some signs in the heavens. This is a picture of that annular eclipse uh, last Sunday. I think this was from China. I don't remember where I got this. But anyway, it's kind of amazing some of these things. <clears throat> Do you know where this took place in the heavens? Taurus. <laughs> That's where it took place. Uh, you can see this is where it's coming into an eclipse in the heart of the bull, in the heart of Taurus. Now, the amazing thing to me, here it was May 20th, 2012, but guess what? It was ER 28, Jerusalem Day, the same day Jerusalem captured, was captured by Israel in 1967. So here you have it happening in the heart of Taurus on ER 28, which is the very day Israel recaptured Jerusalem in the 1967 war. Oh. <clears throat> now, do you guys remember what was the day on our calendars in 67? No, not, no, not, not talking 1948, we're talking about 1967 war. It was June 6th. It was June 6th. Now, on the biblical calendar, it was ER 28. And so that's why, I mean, of course, Israel is going to go by the biblical calendar first, you know, the regular calendar second. So that's why it was, you know, it's, it's celebrated kind of both times. Jerusalem Day is celebrated on ER 28, and it's also celebrated on June 6th. One is more or less when it happened on the biblical calendar, and then one is when it happened on our calendar. Right? Which I think was significant that it was seven, seven days before Shavuot yes. that this event happened. Okay, what I want to do now is talk a minute about the planet Venus. You can see Mercury is the smallest one, and then Venus, and then Earth, and then Mars. And I have here the Hebrew word for Venus, and what is it? Noga. And what is your daughter's name? Noga. <laughs> Okay, I have this confirmed. This is the name for the planet Venus, and we, you get the word brightness. Remember Venus is what, the bright and morning star? Okay, so that's Danny's daughter's name, is this bright, beautiful morning star. It means to be brilliant, to be clear, to be shining. I have on here this, uh, the Aramaic word is basically the same, Strong number 5053, and it means the dawn or the morning. That's why Venus is known as what? The morning star. All right? And the morning star gives most of its light just before the break of day. Okay, so here's a picture of Venus. You know, as you know, it travels. But anyway, I just want to see how bright it was. This, see, Venus is known as the bright morning star. And it's the, basically the brightest natural object in the night sky next to the moon. The moon is going to be the brightest. The second brightest is the planet Venus. And Venus reaches its maximum brightness shortly before sunrise or shortly after sunset. For which reason it has been known as both the morning star and the evening star. As a matter of fact, when it's morning in one place, it's evening in the other place. Okay? In Isaiah 62, 1, it says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as Noga, or as Venus, and Yeshua as the lamp that burneth. 
So remember what Danny was saying the other day about parallelism in Hebrew. They say the same thing twice in two different ways. So it's almost like it's saying goes forth as Venus and Yeshua as the lamp that burns, equating Yeshua with the planet Venus. Now, Isaiah 61 through 3, it says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you, the Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. That's no God. Okay, so again, it's, it's like the brightness of Yeshua. Look at 2 Peter 1.19. We have also a more sure word of what? Prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your heart. It's like the planet Venus arising, but it's Yeshua rising in your heart. Yeshua is likened unto that day star, which again refers to brightness and refers to Venus. Now here's something, uh, here's a picture of, uh, this time I didn't take away the land. This is this coming July 9th, the west coast at 4 in the morning. You can see the land here and Venus is rising. It's just right next to the land. It's that bright morning star at 4 in the morning. Okay, but here's something that I want to talk about that's kind of interesting. So here is Venus. And listen to this. This is what I've got from one website. It says, Venus is one of the four solar terrestrial planets, meaning that like the Earth, it also has a rocky body. In size and mass, it is very similar to the Earth. Venus is often described as Earth's sister. Okay? Earth's sister. Now, what I think is interesting is our relationships with the Lord. We have a lot of different relationships, and so does Israel. Think about this. Israel is called son. Israel is called daughter. Okay? Uh, you know, and so we have these relationships with God. God's our father. God's our brother. You know, and so we have these different relationships. So when God speaks to us about Israel, you know, how, how does he do it? He tries to describe it in different ways. But did you know that, like, he's our group, the bride and the groom. So here, so all these different relationships. But did you know that not only... Are we called his bride? We're called his sister. Did any of you know that we're called God's or the the bridegroom's sister? Yeah. Look at this. This is from. Let me see where I'm at. Song of Solomon four verse nine. He says, "You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse." And guess how many times he calls the bride's sister here in the Song of Solomon? Seven times. Seven times you see the word sister mentioned in the Song of Solomon, and he's, he's speaking to him, her as my sister, my spouse. So again, it's just trying to form different relationships. Now what I think is interesting is, again, Venus and Earth are called sisters, and here you have us and Yeshua, and we're called the bride and also his sister. So I want you to see this correlation here. Pallades is known as the seven sisters. Pallades, the seven stars. You can look it up. They're also known as the seven sisters. So here you have the seven stars or the seven sisters. And then, so I want you to think of Venus as Yeshua. In Revelation, he comes to the seven churches. It's like he's coming to his seven sisters. Is everyone connecting with me here? Okay. Guess what happened this last year at Passover in the sky? Get a little of this. Do you see Venus? Over Passover, you're going to see her visit the seven sisters like he's visiting the seven churches in Revelation. Now watch this. This is, this is what happened at Passover, roughly. We're going to start here, first March 31st. Let me go to the next one. Here's April 3rd. You'll see the Venus is right there with Pallades. And then April 6th moves just past it. That was Passover. So it's like right before Passover, going into Passover, you have in Taurus, where the, 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 it's like his bride, his sister is being protected. It's like he's doing, he's, he's going through inspecting the bride. Wow. Now, <laughs> let's 
let's see, how do we do this? Do you know that in, not this coming Wednesday, but next Wednesday, here, think of bookends. You have this eclipse, okay, of the sun and the moon in Taurus a week before Passover. I mean, a week before Shavuot, Pentecost. Do you know there's going to be another eclipse in a week and a half? Here you're going to have bookends. Okay, you have these bookend eclipses on either side of Shavuot. What's going to happen is this. You're going to see another eclipse of the sun with the planet Venus. Venus is going to intersect the sun. Now, this is going to happen right here. Here's a picture of it. And it's going to be right between the horns of the bull. That's where it's going to take place this time. And it's going to take place on Jerusalem Day, June 6th. So here you have, right before Passover, on ER 28, you have the moon eclipsing the sun in Taurus. And then a week after Shavuot, you can have Venus eclipsing the sun right in the middle of the horns. Now, the sun represents the nations. Yeshua is about to go to war against the nations who are coming to divide Israel. Okay, here, it, 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 all that purpose is God the bull. And it's like, okay, this is what's coming. Judgment is coming to the nations. Now you're going to see this all in the scriptures as this unfolds. First, I want to talk about this eclipse of the Venus and the sun. How often do we on earth get to see an eclipse of Venus and the sun? Okay? You can go to NASA's website, and I'm going to read directly from their website. It says, the transits or transits of Venus across the disk of the sun are among the rarest of planetary alignments. Indeed, only six such events have occurred before this century since the invention of the telescope. Okay? Here's when they occurred. I have the dates right here. December 7th of 1631, 1639. 1761, 1769, 1874, 1882, and then it's, uh, happens, it happened eight years ago in 2004, it's happening in 2012, this will not happen again for another hundred some years. So it gives you an idea of how rare this is. Now because God did everything mathematically, they now can tell you exactly to the day when they've happened 5,000 years ago and when they're going to happen the next 5,000 years. I don't know if you notice a pattern here. They're eight years apart. And then they're 122, 105. 122, 105 years. This is the exact pattern. It's actually 122.5 and 105.5. But I'm just giving you the, the idea that everything is in a pattern when it comes to math, when it comes to astronomy, when it comes to biblically different things happening. So that's how they can tell you exactly when they've happened, how long ago they happened, and how often they're going to happen. Okay, it's all science. Let me see, make sure it's right place. Okay, when a transit of Venus occurs, a second one often follows eight years later. This is because, here's the reason why, the orbital period of Venus is 224,701 days. I don't mean 224,000, I mean 224. 224.7 days. So it takes Venus 224.7 days to circle the sun. The Earth is 365.25 days. Well, they are, they are in an eight year resonance with each other. So in other words, every eight years, they're gonna, the cycle is going to end up coming close together, which is why you see every eight years it's like this. Uh, in other words, in the time it takes Earth to orbit the Sun eight times, Venus completes almost exactly 13 revolutions around the Sun. So when the Earth goes eight times around the Sun, Venus has gone 13 times around the Sun. As a result, Venus and Earth line up in the same position with respect to the Sun. So transits show a clear pattern of recurrence of intervals at 8, and then 121.5, 122, and then 8, and 105.5 years. Now here's the thing, from a scientific point of view, the transits of Venus are only possible during early December and early June. That's why you see these are all June and Decembers. 
That's the only time mathematically that this can happen. <clears throat> so here's what's amazing. I just kind of, you can get this calendar for free. It's a download of, you know, when you can go back many years and see when they fell on the biblical calendar. And one of the things that I did was kind of fun just to look to see if there was any significance to any of these. Shavuot weekend on that set. Kislev 25 Hanukkah in that set. Jerusalem Day this year. And in 2004, the Venus went this direction, like that. Or 2012, that's coming up. 2004, it transited the sun down here. And in 2012, it's going to come across the sun here. Now, the, the question is, okay, well, where are we going to be? Are we going to be able to see this? In 2004... The United States couldn't have seen it at all because it's all in the dark. There was, it wasn't visible. But it was visible entirely through Europe and Africa. So this kind of gives you an idea of where in 2004. Now, unless you were lived somewhere else than here, in 2004 we didn't see this. So that's why it's kind of not on our radar. It didn't affect us at all. And it only happened, doesn't happen again for another 100 years. You can see how this is a once in a lifetime event for anybody and everybody. Here it is for Venus, uh, I mean for 2012 coming up, we're going to get a great view, okay, but it's going to be at sunset. So at sunset next week, uh, you're going to be able to see the eclipse if you stay up. I think it's like almost at 10 o'clock at night or, you know, whatever sunset is. But anyway, if we have clear skies here in Washington, you'll be able to see it. And uh, again, it will be able to be seen in, the, in Israel and in the Middle East. So, anyway, I just wanted to give you an idea of just when and where this is going to be seen. For this eclipse to take place, it takes six hours. So if you want to see the whole thing, some of these places are going to see all six hours. Here in Washington, we're only going to see, I don't know if it's an hour or what, we're not going to see the whole thing because the sun's setting. But we're going to be able to see the beginnings of it. You following me? So some people get to see all six hours. Israel, you know, some of the places they'll be able to see it during the day. Can you imagine being in Israel and you're watching for six hours? You can see Venus transiting the sun. Wow. And like I said, where does this occur? In Taurus. And again, like I said, the sun represents the nations. So God is going to go to war against the nations. Listen to Zechariah. This is chapter 12. Verse 6 through 9. And remember, all the barren is in the eye of the bull, and it means the governor or leader. And it says in Zechariah 12, 6 through 9, In that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem will be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also will save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David... And the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. And that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God, and as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that are coming against Jerusalem. And this is happening on Jerusalem Day, guys. Make these connect I mean, look at this. Listen to the connection of what happened a week before Shavuot on Jerusalem Day. Here at Shavuot, we can have on Jerusalem Day, so both calendars, be it the pagans or the Jews, are all going to see it happens on the same day. It doesn't matter which calendar it's on. These things are happening. I mean, this is not coincidence. No. No. Not at all. Here's something else that I shared several months ago at El Sedai. This year is very significant when it comes to alignments. Okay, just like your chiropractor, you've got to get an alignment. There was something special about this particular religious calendar year that's different than most religious calendar years, which is why it's exciting to see these events happening this year, because God is getting everything in alignment. Let's go. This year, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, 
was a special Rosh Chodesh Nisan. As you know, uh, Nisan 1 could fall on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, or Thursday, or Friday as the calendar moves, but this year it fell on Shabbat. Now, what is so incredible about that is the Torah portion that it fell on was Vayikra, which is Leviticus 1.1. 1, 1. So here we have, it fell on a Sabbath, and that Torah portion, the Ikra, is all about Moses assembling the tabernacle. And this Torah portion is about the very day Moses was assembling the tabernacle. And so here you're reading about Moses setting up the tabernacle on the day Moses set up the tabernacle on the Shabbat, which was the son of one, on the very day from the very Torah portion that the events actually happened. And in Exodus 12, 1 through 3, is where it says, The Lord has spoken to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month will be to you the beginning of months. It will be the first month of the year to you. So this is, this is the Esau 1. This is, this, this is what Moses understood. And this reading contains the very first commandment given to the Jewish people as a nation to sanctify the new moon. And so here they're keeping the very first commandment. And it's a Shabbat. And they're reading about Moses assembling the tabernacle. So how often do we see in the alignment of the Torah portion, see it's one thing for Nisan 1 to fall on a Shabbat, it's another thing for it to fall on the Shabbat at the same time the Torah portion is being read by Ikra. When does that happen again? 2015. 2015, it falls on the Shabbat, Nisan 1, so again, you can see how significant 2015 is in the alignment of things that are coming. In one sense, the, the Rosh Kodesh reading, what I just read in Exodus 12, describes how this supernatural change of a calendar is going to influence their everyday lives. Because no longer are we on the normal pagan calendar. God says, I want you on, you're to be separate from the rest of the nations. I want you on my calendar, not their calendar. As a matter of fact, what's kind of interesting about this year, also, it says in Genesis 8, 14 through 16, it was in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, that the earth dried from Noah's flood. And God spoke unto Noah, saying, Go forth out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives with you. So what do we see? Oh, first off, I want to bring out here, in case you didn't know, in July 2015, we have a total solar eclipse as well. That falls right at Nissan 1 on the religious calendar. So this is why 2015 is very significant. But now I want you to look at Genesis 8, 14 through 16. On the 27th day of the month is when Noah, the earth was dried. It's November 13th this year of 2012. Is the 27th day of Heshvan. I have the 28th day of Heshvan. Let's see, November 13th. Oh, yeah. I'm pointing out November 13th. The Genesis said it was on the 27th day that the earth was dried. And guess what? So the next year, or the next day, is the first day of Noah's new life. And we have another total solar eclipse this year on the very day after Noah stepped off the ark on the biblical calendar. So you can see that this year also is going to be pretty exciting with what's coming. In other words, it's like new beginnings. Now, if you remember April 4th, 2015, we have the total lunar eclipse on Passover. This is after the total solar eclipse on Nissan 1 in 2015. Two weeks later, we have the total lunar eclipse on Passover. And then the end of the year, we have the solar eclipse on the Feast of Trumpets, followed by the next lunar eclipse on Sukkot. So there's a 2015 is looking up to be a very interesting year. But now here's something that blew me away this morning that I hadn't seen before. Now I showed this already, but there's a twist to this. The Shemitah years. Now how do you know a Shemitah year? Did you say it's the Hebrew years divisible by seven? That's the Shemitah year. So here in 2001, which was a Shemitah year, 
That's when the economy collapsed and where the Dow was down 7%. This is the day before Rosh Hashanah. 2008, the next meeting year, seven years later, even though it's different days on our calendar, September 29th, the Dow fell again 7%. I don't know what's coming on September 13th, 11, 29, and 2015, but we sure got a lot of signals coming from God. Falling on Jerusalem Day and Passover and Sukkot and all of these things. These are the three solar eclipses all on the first of Av that begins. You see all the tsunamis and earthquakes and everything that happened. Here are the three solar eclipses in a row happening on Jerusalem Day. There was one last year also on Jerusalem Day. Okay. And there's one next year that falls, I think, like the day after Jerusalem Day. I mean, so it's like God is saying, look, everything's coming to this head. In 2015, all signals on the biblical holidays and feast days. <coughs> Let me see if I have another big... Okay. Here's the thing. Do you notice the pattern of every seven years? You see that? Do you remember when I told you about how God was judging the earth starting in 1994? Do you know that was a Shemitah year? 94, 2001, 2008, 2015. In Jeremiah, God judged Israel during the Shemitah year because they had let everyone go free and then they turned around and went back, so God judged them. The Shemitah year are years of judgment that God is bringing to His people when they're not doing what He says. So in 1994, what happened is like this was the Shemitah year on the 9th of Bob, and God says, listen to me, these are my words. And 21 fragments. What's 1994 plus 21? 2015. These are your 21, your three Shemitah years. And what do you find in Leviticus 26? God says, if you don't do what I say, I'll punish you seven more times. And then if you don't do what I say, I'm going to punish you seven more times. And then if you don't do what I say, guess what? He says, I'm going to punish you seven more times. This is the last of the seven more times. Oh, wow. 1994, he was judging, the, telling, this is what's coming. This is what's coming. Again, this is, the 1994 was like the mile down the road bridges out. Now we're like eight feet. So in 1994 was the Shemitah year. Guess what? 1973 Yom Kippur War was the Shemitah year. I'm just telling you, you've got to look at the Shemitah year pattern. Here in 1994, Jupiter is slammed. Jupiter representing righteousness. God is saying, I'm going to judge this world in righteousness. The following Shemitah year, 2001, the Dow fell. The next Shemitah year, 2008, the Dow fell. We are now at the end of this pattern of the Shemitah years. So judgment is coming. I'm, I'm not saying what day or what date, but I'm just all I'm saying is look at the pattern. And I'm not saying what's going to happen, but I'm just saying we need to get ready. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.